I think Bond's the one who needed to take some vitamins in this movie. Hey everybody, welcome to Mainly Movies. Today, we're gonna to be continuing my 007 review series with the 14th James Bond film, 1985's A View to a Kill. If you're new here, please consider subscribing for a variety of movie-related content like reviews, rank lists, and trailer reactions. All my reviews include a breakdown of the pros and cons, my rating, and some tailored film recommendations, so be sure to watch through to the end of this video for all of that extra content. A View to a Kill stars Roger Moore, Christopher Walken, and Tanya Roberts, and was directed by John Glenn. It tells the story of James Bond, Bond, played by Roger Moore in his final 007 outing as he investigates the inventor of a weaponized microchip. This franchise is just absolutely full of films that are baffling yet entertaining. I feel like I've said this in at least every other Bond review, but A View to a Kill is a strange one. Maybe it was because the filmmakers felt like they had to ramp things up to stay relevant after the non-Eon produced Never Say Never Again two years earlier, but this plot's really all over the place. It all links together in a way that is reasonable, I guess, but it takes a very strange path to get to its eventual endpoint. Although the core story is somewhat mundane, there are so many ridiculous elements thrown in that it gains a level of entertainment value it probably wouldn't otherwise deserve. This film features some early globetrotting, which sends Bond up the Eiffel Tower and down a mountain on a makeshift snowboard, but as an oddly placed Beach Boys song for shadows, the bulk of the story's climax takes place in California. Something that struck me as interesting during this series of Bond rewatches is that despite these films being set all over the world, they've yet to have any on-screen text indicating location during an establishing shot. That's something that's so prevalent and arguably overused in films today, so I'm curious to see when that first makes an appearance in the Bond franchise. A View to a Kill's story and setup might be a tad convoluted, but the villainous scheme is oddly refreshing, despite its inherent silliness. Initiation of World War III? Nope. Smuggling? Uh-uh. Generic world domination? Wrong again. No, the big plot is to create something the Bond world has never seen the likes of before. An earthquake. But not just any earthquake. A double earthquake. It all sounds like the evil plot of a villain on some silly Saturday morning cartoon, but it was actually stupidly fun. That cartoonish nature is only heightened by our main villains, Max Zorin, played by an over-the-top distractingly blonde Christopher Walken, and his even more striking and over-the-top henchwoman, Mayday. If you couldn't tell by now, this is one of the goofy Bond movies. It's not quite as ridiculous as Moonraker, for instance, but it's not really that far off. I know this is commonly thought of as one of the low points for the franchise, but it honestly doesn't feel that different from the movies that came before it, and has always seemed like a fitting end to the Moore era for me. The plot's goofy, and most of the characters are ridiculous, but it's the action that cements this film's position in the goofy Bond category. So many of the sequences just have this crazy random feel to them. They're fun, but they mostly consist of things happening to Bond as opposed to him intentionally doing anything. Things like the makeshift snowboard scene, or the eye-rolling fire truck sequence that Terminator 3 totally ripped off, or even the crazy steeplechase scene that feels like something out of a video game. Even the absurd final fight sequence has this overly goofy feel to it, but somehow remains entertaining largely because of that over-the-top silliness. Given that this is Roger Moore's final outing as Bond, I should probably talk about him a little bit, but honestly, there's not much to say. This was definitely one of his weaker performances. He was nearly 60 years old when this film was released, and as was the case with Octopussy two years before, his exploits seem a bit unbelievable here. His action sequences have also taken a noticeable hit, though I think he still fares better than Connery did in Never Say Never Again. So although Bond wasn't at his best here, the primary character disappointment for me was this film's Bond girl, Stacey Sutton. She actually begins as a decent, moderately strong character, but it doesn't take long for her to become an irritating, whiny mess. From the elevator scene onward, she's constantly crying out to Bond, and really serves no purpose to the story other than to function as a damsel in distress. She has her moments, but she's definitely one of the weaker, most inept Bond girls in the whole franchise. Franchise. I mean, seriously, how exactly does an airship sneak up on a person? Alright, let's talk about the pros and cons. 
The only real pro here is the villain plot. It's admittedly very silly and extremely convoluted, but it's pretty unique. I guess it does have that monopoly control intended outcome that's sort of reminiscent of Goldfinger, but it takes a very different approach. It's not often that man-made natural disasters so prominently feature in a movie like this. On the con side, the biggest issue is definitely the Bond girl. This has consistently been one of my major points of contention in the franchise. I really like the Bond girls that are competent, or at least sorta of good at their job, even if they fall for Bond's cheesy lines. But it seems like we only get a decently strong Bond girl every two or three movies. The rest of them are either intentionally incompetent, extremely whiny damsels in distress, or largely unnecessary to the story. Stacey Sutton satisfies the latter two criteria, so even though she has some decent moments earlier in the film, she eventually devolves into an extremely irritating, ditzy character. Con number two is a bit broad, but I guess the best way I could describe it is that this movie is a strange mix. Everything from the tone, to the plot, to the characters, it all feels really cobbled together. It's very convoluted and incoherent at points, but the larger plot does eventually work its way out. It's one of the goofier entries in the franchise, but there are a lot of moments of surprising brutality for a movie so silly otherwise. Combine that with the Duran Duran theme song and Day Glow ultra 80s title sequence, and you've got a movie that's trying to be so many different things that it never quite fits together. I'm gonna give A View to a Kill 3 out of 5 paws. It's a low 3 for me, but despite the movie's many flaws, I still find it to be fairly entertaining and a decent close to the Moore era. I would recommend A View to a Kill to fans of the goofy Bond movies. It's not quite Moonraker level goofy, but think more along the lines of Live and Let Die, where so many inexplicably random things happen, yet it remains fun. Roger Moore fans will also like seeing him in his last 007 movie, but otherwise you'll probably want to focus your attention elsewhere in the franchise. If you liked A View to a Kill, I would recommend the ninth Bond film, The Man with the Golden Gun. It's another Roger Moore-led Bond in which an environmentally based disaster is the primary threat. This one is probably one of Moore's more serious toned Bonds, but that means it still has a chair of goofiness. It's also got another one of the most frustratingly inept Bond girls in the franchise. If you liked Zorin and want another greedy Bond villain, you should definitely check out the third Bond movie, Goldfinger. It also has a fun, elaborate villain plot, and it too features a henchman of unexpected skill and stature. And if you want to compare this movie to a similarly silly final Bond outing, you should watch the seventh Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever. It was Sean Connery's last official time in the role of Bond, and it also features some strikingly strange and over-the-top villains, not to mention a US setting. All right, a couple questions for you guys. Number one, have you seen A View to a Kill? If so, what'd you think of it? And number two, what's your favorite movie featuring an airship or blimp? Be sure to leave your answers in the comments below so we can get a discussion going. All right, so if you got some enjoyment, insight, or information out of this review, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe while you're at it to see more videos like this. Till next time, this has been Alyssa with Mainly Movies the way life should be.